select board meeting, get in touch with the town administrator, because we will be tasked with appointing somebody for these positions, the select board will be, if no one runs for these open seats. So if anybody's got any interest in, in planning or other open seats, that would be great. Uh, Renee? I just have a question, Dave Carpenter. So is anyone running in a writing candidate that's not a I don't know. No. For planning? Yeah, for planning. Yeah, I don't know. Right. But that's that's been an issue in the past is sometimes um, maybe people don't know about the open positions on some of these boards, but we would love to have people come in um, if they've got interest in any of these open board seats. It's not too late to mount a write-in campaign. As <laughs> it's not too late. It takes what, 25 votes, I think. Is it 25? I think so. Yes, ma'am. Is it 30? Okay. okay. Um, so the planning commission is tasked with uh, planning. That's what, why it's called planning. <laughs> so there's two meetings generally a month. The first. What's that? Yeah, Zach, Zach is here, the chairman, but I'll just, I'll just quickly touch on it. So first and third Thursday, they have meetings, usually 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, and they talk about the town plan, which may need to be updated. They talk about zoning, which may need to be changed. So they do the planning portion of the zoning aspect in the town. They're not enforcement. The Development Review Board does the actual granting of permits and listens to appeals of permits, et cetera. They strictly do the planning aspect. Now, Zach Sullivan's here. He's a chairman, existing chairman of the Planning Commission. It, does he have anything to add to that? No, nothing significant, but if, if anyone's interested, you're welcome to come talk to me. That's Zach Sullivan. If anyone's interested, you can write it in a name. Write in a name on your voting. That's Kim Watson. Um, one, one thing, one note, is if you get up to say something, please introduce yourself. Um, that's OK. I just. I know that's what Michael Duane usually says, but maybe he forgot. <laughs> I got, I got, and in fact, I, I have right here, um, we have four students from the East Montpelier Elementary School who are our pages, and it's uh, Brianna, Caitlin, Calvin, and Karis. And they're standing on the sides with portable microphones. And so for order and uh, identification purposes for the record, if you raise your hand to be recognized, uh, one of our student pages can come over with the microphone for you. That would be helpful to all. Thanks. Very good. Thank you so much, Mr. Wayne. Right. <laughs> you are? <laughs> yes, sir. Did you raise your hand? How long is the term for the plan? Um, they, they're either two or three years. And the ones that are open, I don't see it here, but they're either two or three years. They, is that correct, Zach? Two or three years? Three year terms. Three years. So it will take us through the cycle where we are updating the town plan for the next two years, and then into a cycle where we're probably looking at whether zoning changes need to be made. Now, to implement the town plan you know, as it's changed. Now, the other thing is, you know, well, I'm not going to go into the fact that sometimes people can't serve the whole term, and that's okay, because we really like you to serve the whole term. But, you know, it happens that sometimes people move out of town, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's hard for the select board sometimes to appoint people because we really want to get people that are interested, and sometimes that's hard to find. So there you go. All right, so any more questions on the open positions? So I want to go to page 14, which is a select board report. Um, and I'll just scroll down through it quickly, and then we we'll, can answer questions. Um, so paragraph two deals with select board membership has changed. Um, we had a longstanding member, Amy Willis, step down from the select board and her husband ran for his, his seat, her seat. And it is Mr. Hess, Scott Hess. He is in the middle here. Um, we had a lot of talk about his outfit today. <laughs> so. That's <laughs> so Scott I, I changed. Asked, I asked, I asked uh, Seth last night at the select board meeting um, 
what color cummerbund I should be wearing. Because <laughs> this, this was my first select board meeting and, and town meeting. Um, and he said I probably should not wear any cummerbund. So I dressed it. Uh, well, For there, were, tuxedo, okay. there were other aspects of a, his attire that we touched upon, but I don't <laughs> want to go into it any further. <laughs> So anyway, um, then we had Judith Dillon on the select board. She, she couldn't finish her term, so Zoe got appointed. She's fourth down for me. Um, and she's running now for the seat permanently, for the three-year term. And she served one year, so she has two years left. Uh, um, no one's running against her, correct. The other seat that's open is Tom Brazier and Nick are running. Um, Nick has been appointed on a temporary basis to fill John Jewett's term. John moved out of town, um, and so he couldn't finish what he was doing. Though he could have zoomed in, but whatever. <laughs> um, and there has been some changes in the town office, and I'm not really going to go into that unless people ask me questions. It's just people have had different changes in their lives. They've had to move away. They have relatives to take care of, et cetera, et cetera. So it's nothing going on internally in the office. It's more that people have had changes in their life and have had to do different things. Um, the next thing, road crew was mentioned in the select board report. Um, that has been pretty um, stable. The only real difference on this road crew is we've had a little bit more part-time help from a new um, person that wanted to work on the road crew, and we've needed some part-time help, especially dealing with all the flood, flooding, et cetera, in July. So we have a new part-time person, Steve Levenberg, um, who's been really uh, nice to have on the road crew. So I touched on the flood. The flood was um, a big deal. East Montpelier did better than most. We didn't have nearly the flooding that our, some of our neighbors had. Um, some sections of road have not been finished because we're dealing with FEMA. And if anybody knows anything about federal agencies, they move slowly. So that's one of the holdups in the repair process is dealing with FEMA and their requirements. But the nice thing about FEMA is eventually the town will be reimbursed a significant amount of money for the repairs that we've made that were due to the flood. So thanks to our town administrator and our road foreman, they have been working on the FEMA stuff due diligently, and it makes a big difference on the money that comes back in, is the process, is following the process. Um, yes? Yeah, that's uh, Nona Estrin, for the record. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's the... The, there's a couple of culverts, or I think one culvert. The What's that? The, the question is which roads have not been repaired due to the flooding? Did you, you got that? Okay. So on Sander Circle, up on off the Horn of the Moon, there was a washed out culvert up there that has not been fixed. Uh, it requires a hydraulic study and FEMA is, will be paying for all that, uh, but the, move, the wheels move slowly with FEMA. And the hydraulic study, the engineers have to be involved. It's a big repair job, it's very expensive. That has not been fixed yet. And then there's a culvert also on Sodom Pond that um, has been fixed temporarily, but that's also one that's gonna be replaced. So there's a couple places in town that require more work. Um, any other questions on that? Uh, then the next item that has mentioned in the select board report is ARPA and Rick yeah. Barstow. Oh, yeah. Rick. Rick. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I thought that culvert on Sodom Pond was not going to be replaced because that has withstood many floods and it's more solid than the ones they put in nowadays. Um, so I don't know why they've changed their minds. I don't either. <laughs> yeah. the state, I can, you want me to? Yeah. The state determined that that culvert could no longer, was no longer acceptable for that location. So we only have a temporary permit to cover. I, I know, but we only have a temporary permit to cover it um, and to repair it to open the road. And 
That permit only lasts 30 months, and then we have to replace the structure. I saw it completely exposed. <laughs> it's beautiful. That, that was Rick Barstow, for the record. I think so. Rick, Rick, Rick again. Go ahead. Um, the thing of it is that culvert did not wash out, it's just the material washed out around it. And it was far easier, far cheaper to just put new material in there and then the culvert was good. Um, you know, next time, if I don't know if these culverts that they're going to put in there, I don't know, it's maybe some giant monstrosity. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I don't know if we'd be any better off. Um, that, that's called common sense, Rick, and that doesn't always play out. Just letting you know. <laughs> okay, yeah, well. Okay. That's, that's super but, yeah. Can you appeal that decision? Can it be? <laughs> you can, uh, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree, but sometimes these things get on a track and it's hard to stop them. But if you wanted to try to appeal it, you probably could, but I don't think that's going to change the outcome. Yes. It's not a town decision at that point. And the thing that happens is to get the FEMA funding to fix this, you have to go through a process. Maybe Gina could. Yeah, I know. Gina, go ahead. God. There we go. There is an H&H &H study hydraulic and hydrologic study that's being done by engineers in the unlikely event that that study actually states that that structure is sufficient, then the structure would remain. Um, but odds are it's, I mean, we, I was with the river scientists when Guthrie and I went out and toured the site and met with her. She was immediately clear that structure was not sufficient to cover. Um, one big question about that structure was its historic significance. So um, I did read, that was one of the delays with FEMA because they kept telling me they did that, but ultimately they didn't. So I worked with someone at the state who reviewed it and unfortunately because of the damage had, that had occurred, the structure no longer retained its historic significance. Um, so it was deemed that it could be completely removed. But yeah, there, there is a study being done right now. The engineers were actually out there. That's why um, Sodom Palm was closed um, on Monday. Um, and that was really for them to start doing some subsurface surface testing. So it, we're waiting on all of these results. So right now, no clue. I've met with the engineer a couple times. Um, no clue exactly what will replace the structure. But yeah, we've kind of gone through a, a, a number of steps. I'm not 100% sure that there is an appeal type process. I've never seen that with the state to appeal these these types of decisions so um, we've received a temporary permit that has a definitive expiration date of when we have to replace the structure that's there or if the town decided not to I'm guessing then no FEMA funds would be I'm not sure what the implication is of not right. doing it that I don't know does that help but one of, one of the things that does happen in these uh, studies is they use a little bit different criteria as far as rainfall goes etc cetera, etc cetera. So we've had an upsized culvert significantly in the town because of the uh, rain events that we have more often. So, you know, when a, when a culvert was adequate for the last 50 years, it is true that they are no longer able to handle the significant rain events that we get now, you know, nine inches at a time, you know. So if you're going to work on a culvert, they'd like to see you make it oversized so it can handle those big rain events. Question from Colin Blackwell. Hey, Seth, Colin Blackwell. Um, it, I was just curious because I talked with Guthrie and his, um, I don't want to speak for him, but we had the concern of the next culverts down. So I just know if there's any discussion on that right now that just could get people informed. If you look at Foster Road, that's an, a, a small culvert too, and then on Horn of the Moon Road. So when a FEMA goes in and puts in a big 
you know, arching culvert, all that water is now available to go down. So should we be looking at the next ones down? It's kind of a... That's a, I mean, that's a good question, but I'm not privy to that information, but I, th what's that? Yeah, ramifications further down the pike. Any more questions concerning the flooding and FEMA? Um, that's a good question. I was looking at that myself. I, I think that's a rented one. You're talking about the picture on, one, right? Picture on page 15? Yeah. Yeah, that's a rented excavator. Now, yeah, that's what I thought. So the good news about the equipment that we use to fix the flood flooding is that money that we spent at that point will be reimbursed to the town through the FEMA funding, which Gina and Guthrie have been working on a lot because it's a lot of paperwork. But we do have, they do have a person, FEMA has a person in Barry that they're working with all the time. So you have to play through the process, but at the end of the process, if you do everything right, you'll get a significant amount of money coming back to the town. Yes, Renee, Renee Carpenter, um, Pages. So pertinent to this discussion, there's legislation talking about responding to flood, et cetera, and so forth, and I'm not privy to it, but it might serve our town and the people who live in our town to find out what that legislation is, which committee it's in, who sits on that committee and go to that committee, either send each person an email or ask to testify at a hearing or raise your questions otherwise, because that's how things happen. So if you're concerned about downstream getting taken care of, that is one place you can go to make sure that it's heard at the state level. And then you won't be arguing with the Agency of Transportation and their hydrologists about what is and what isn't appropriate to the town. Thank you. There's somebody else? No. Well, that's it? Okay. Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a Okay, yeah, I've got a question Ellen here. Ellen Knadler, question. Yeah. Um, this is a little off topic, but um, as I was coming in this morning, I found a $5 bill on the floor. So if anybody's losing a $5 bill, come and see me. You have to identify it. So I would, I'd like to continue on with the select board report. Um, so the next item after the flood was the ARPA funds. And we have done various things with the ARPA money. Um, so if, if there's any questions, it's, it's a little hard to identify every place we put the money, but I can. Yep. Ginny uh, Callan, question. <laughs> On. Thank you. Um, I had a question. There were a couple of select board meetings where there was discussion about a, some grant funding yep. for nonprofits in East Montpelier with ARPA funding, and I'd like to know how that got resolved. Okay, so what, what we did with the money, we decided to give away around $50,000 out of the ARPA money, and we had four applicants for the money. One was Twin Valley Seniors needed money to repave their parking lot. Um, all together now, uh, needed some money to replace the boiler in their main structure where they run daycare and schools for um, pre, pre, I think it's pre-kindergarten children. Um, then the Historical Society wanted a little bit of money 
and the Trails Association needed some money to replace a bridge. So there's four entities in town, nonprofits, that applied for the 50,000. At the end of the day, we gave half the money to Twin Valley to repave the parking lot, which wasn't really enough money to do the whole parking lot, but because people were struggling to get in and out of the building with walkers and canes, et cetera, navigating potholes in the pavement, we decided that that was a very worthy cause to put a bulk of the money, which was half of it. Um, then we gave, I think it was 10,000 to all together now and 10,000 to the Trails, uh, Trails Association to replace the bridge over Mallory Brook. And then we gave 5,000 to the Histor Historical Society to do some upgrades and cabinets so they could display some of the historical artifacts that were down in the town office, gathering dust. So that's kind of how that all played out. Um, could yep. I add to that? Yep. Yeah. So, so that's a great answer to uh, talk about the process that we initiated after Ginny Callen came to the select board and said, hey, how about using some of the, uh, this money for nonprofits in town? Uh, prior to that, we decided right away, we've been hearing for years what a priority good internet service is here in town. And we thought uh, we could, uh, without any compunction, take $100,000 of that and give it to CV Fiber to help them uh, provide connectivity faster to people in town. And the Four Corners Schoolhouse Association came to us and they said, we have a big mold remediation project, and we would like to uh, get uh, $30,000 matching funds from the town so that we could apply for a state grant to take care of that, and, uh, and we gave them that $30,000 out of the ARPA funds. So, so there's a few other th items that we spent the ARPA money on, um, but one thing that we made sure that we did, it was for one-time expenses, so we weren't setting up for future tax increases. What we really did on some of the one-time expenses, we spent the money to keep the municipal tax rate down, which you'll notice in this year's budget that it only went up three cents uh, on the municipal rate, and some of that's because of the shifting of expenses that we did to the ARPA money for one-time expenses to soften the blow to the taxpayers. One other thing that we did is we did keep some of the money by like, an accounting procedure in the money, in the capital reserve fund. We've got over $200,000 to put towards future capital projects um, that we may deem worthy of supporting. You know, if we do do the town garage, we've got some money in the capital reserve to put towards that project. So, that's, are there any other questions about the ARPA money? Because we're all here and we definitely can answer your questions, but uh, that's kind of a summation of what we did. Um, so I don't see any others. So I'm gonna keep going on with the select board report. And the next one, which kind of segues into the last paragraph, is talking about the town, potential town garage replacement. Um, so where we are on that project is we've identified a need in town to replace the existing garage. Um, we went out for bids for a sketch, a sketch plan on that site to replace that garage. It's going to cost the town up to $40,000 to get the sketch plan. That money is not coming out of your taxes. That is ARPA money that we spent for this one-time expense. Once we get the sketch plan made, or the potential design comes into our hands, we put that out for informational meetings for the town folks to look at, to comment on, to tweak, or whatever. Um, and then, being how, we'll see how the informational meetings go. I don't have the design in my hand yet, or our hands yet. We will, put it out to bond, vote. So if the townspeople think that the plan is a good one, they get to vote on that, we'd have to borrow the money to build the garage. So that's where that project is at the moment. We've also hiring a town representative to represent our interests in the garage project, to do our due diligence and to keep an eye on the project, to keep it within our parameters and our goals, our financial expectations. We have someone representing us. And they are just hired on a per hour basis. It's not a lot of money. 
but it is a good idea to have our interests protected at all times. So are there any other questions about that? And, and, and the other thing that's also happened with this project is we have Andy Shapiro, who's a longtime town resident, who's very invested in um, the latest and best technology as far as green building, energy efficiency, et cetera. He's been on board with the whole project, a huge amount of help, and um, he keeps his eye on the ball at all times, as I do myself. So if anyone is wondering about carbon footprints and green, blah, 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 he's the man to talk to, and he is looking at the plans almost every day. So that's, that's where it's at. Yes, Rachel? We are going to have a further discussion under Article um, 3 on the town garage itself. So unless there was a pressing question, we are going to move into a separate discussion about that momentarily. Looks like. But uh, Rachel, if you have, another qu if you have a yeah. question related? I, we can't hear you. Thanks. I was just going to ask for a little bit more detail about what's wrong with the garage, but if that can wait till question yeah, three. Coming, up, sure. in a, coming okay. up in a few minutes. Yeah. Um, so there really isn't much else on the select board report. Um, we do have a new fire chief, Albert Petrella. Um, if anybody's got any questions about the workings of the fire department ambulance service, he can answer them, or I can also, because the select board does go to meetings fairly regularly, and um, we're all pretty well versed with what's going on, but Albert's right there every day, so he could be reached, or I don't think he's here, but he could be asked any questions more specific to the inner workings. Um, and then the last item on the select board report is the budget. I think I've already touched on it, but we've managed to keep the increases down uh, as far as the municipal tax rate goes. Um, Gina Jenkins, our town administrator, has done a tremendous amount of work on the budget and working with the numbers uh, very, uh, very specifically each item. So we managed to keep it down due to her hard work, actually. And um, also because we shifted some one-time expenses to the ARPA money, we've been able to keep the tax rate down to a sustainable increase. So if there's any questions about that, you can direct them to me, Gina, Carl, whoever, on the select board. Um, because we've gone over the expenses with a fine tooth comb, and we want to keep the tax rate increases to a sustainable level. We actually, I'd like to do it not at all, but unfortunately, with an inflationary environment that we're in, it's really hard to keep the ex expenses even. So they had to go up, but we've tried to minimize the increases. So any questions on that? Any other questions for the chair? With regard to Article 2, hearing the report, which we've accepted to hear, we don't need to approve it. It's already in the warning. Hearing none, Article 2 is concluded. Article 3, which is to discuss the replacement of the town garage. Is there a motion to discuss the placement of the town garage? No vote is going to be taken, but is there a motion to? Hillary Farrington and Ellen Knadler moved and seconded Article 3 to discuss the replacement of the town garage and chair board, chair of the select board, Seth Gardner, is going to start off the discussion. So um, I just want to touch on it very quickly, why we've decided to replace the town garage, because I think that's one of the questions coming up. It was originally, the first part of it was built in the 50s, it's been added on multiple times. Unfortunately, the equipment has outgrown the garage, so there's really impossible to fit all the equipment in the garage. And um, so we've had to utilize the fire department building, which is right next to the town garage. We've taken up a bay or two there to put some of the equipment. Um, but to work on the equipment and to fit it into the existing building is just about impossible. Um, so, you know, the thing is that when the town buys equipment, it, they don't do it willy-nilly. They do it because they need to maintain the roads. They need to cut down the ash trees, we need to do this, that, and everything else. So demands on the road crew have actually gotten more and more and more, especially with climate change and people expect a certain level of service in the town. And to meet those expectations, it takes a fair amount of equipment and labor. So because we are evolving in a different world, we've had to, we need to upgrade our town garage 
to reflect the needs that we have going forward. Now, <clears throat> it's expensive. So that's the biggest rub in the whole thing is the expense. So anyway, I'm, a, I'm willing to answer any questions that I can on the project. Can I add a description? What's that? Can I add a description of the tightness? You can. I just, I, th I just thought it would be helpful for people to know that I went to take photographs to eventually share with all of you to see just how tight and small and cramped it is in the garage. Um, I'm not exaggerating and I have photographic evidence to prove that these machines are being parked within this distance of the wall, backed into, they're literally being backed in and coming this far away from the wall. It's amazing. Um, but as it is, and I think in the, the second, the, the other bay where the fire station is, um, when the doors close, the actual, the fire escapes are blocked and it's currently not, it's not a safe environment at all. Um, the, the workers have to actually jump over plows to be able to move around the truck. So it, it really is, like Seth said, it's literally almost impossible in the, in the literal sense of the word. And I, I, I am going, I'm working on trying to share photographs with all of you. Thank you, Zoe. So anyway, we're here to answer questions um, about the potential replacement of the town garage. Any questions for the chair? I see a hand up. There's one in the back there. Uh, looks like Edith um, Edie Miller. Oh, people like to sit in the back, buddy. Yeah. And then um, they don't want to be. Ready. I'm Edie Miller. I. Um, I just want to go back to what you mentioned before, Seth. You said there is a, you've designated a person to be involved in the planning. Could you explain that a little more? Who is the person and what are they involved in? Are you talking, are they representing the town with the, the people who are presenting a design or what, what's, what does that mean? So the town representative is someone that represents the interests of the town and protects them. So the town representative who we've just hired, I don't even know the name, VIS Services, I think they call it. Um, so that's a firm that has people working for them, and they would come to the town and report to the town on what's going on with the project. And when they go meet with the architects that are designing the building, they make sure that our interests are always foremost. So they're doing their due diligence to protect our interests. That's what they do. That's so when we're building, they will be inspecting materials when they come in. They'll be comparing what gets built against the plans. They'll be doing everything they can to make sure that the building is carried out according to the plan and to protect what our, our taxpayers' money was being spent on and to make sure that invoices line up with the bills, blah, blah, blah. Line, make sure the invoices line up with what's being delivered to the site. So there's a lot of different little tasks that they'll be doing. Then they will report to the select board. Um, we're hoping, we're going to meet with a representative at the next meeting, and we're going to set up a timeline for the reports that they'll be making to us. So they may be able to zoom in to every meeting to report to us of what's going on, especially also as chairman of the select board. I've pledged to go visit the site regularly because it's not far from me to make sure everything is going as planned. So that's kind of the process that we've sort of outlined as we move forward. As you probably realize at this point, we have just started down this path. So. I think that's a very good approach to have a town's representative. Can you tell us who that person is? I don't know. I don't have the name. Okay. Yeah, the firm is VIS. I think it was Peter or somebody, but okay. um, we don't. We have not met the person yet. Okay. Like I said, we're just started the process, and we've we have we have um, we have committed to hiring the firm because we did put it out um, to bid, and we only had one respondent. But the respondent, um, on the recommendation of Andy Shapiro, they are a good firm to work with and then they are going to send their person to meet us. 
Good. Um, and I want to just stress again that Andy Shapiro, who has been working with us, is very, very qualified to help us through the process. He's a volunteer. He's done a tremendous amount of work, and he really knows what he's doing. So you can feel comfortable that at the end of the day, there's going to be good representation of the town, of their interests, and also they will come up with a building that's going to meet the needs of the road crew and also to meet uh, the various criteria that we put forth as far as uh, carbon building, carbon, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of little different nuances to planning the projects. It's not just putting a box up there. It's also meeting energy goals and also the needs. So that's about um, all I can say on that. But I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to answer more questions. Um, yep. Stephen Miracle had his hand up, and then Betsy Barstow, one of the pages, gives Stephen the microphone, please. And on a note of moderator's privilege, I'd like to welcome Norma Raymond to our town meeting. Uh, Stephen, you have the floor. Any questions? Um, yes, hi, Steve Miracle, and um, this, this is uh, awkward for me, but I'll try. So um, and my understanding is that the idea is to use the existing uh, building lot where there's uh, a structure that is undersized for the needs of the road crew to do the work that they're trying to do, and uh, the proposal is to knock the building down and put up a, a new fancy building with, you know, solar panels on the roof. And I'm questioning that, given on, uh, given the, the the history of, uh, well, what I watched happen with our emergency building when a lot of money was invested in architects uh, to renovate a building that turned out that we couldn't even have it there because the state was reconstructing the intersection. And we ended up carrying the architectural plans across the road to a lot that we bought and built a building that was really kind of a dumb building, didn't need to be. So I'm sort of being brave and speaking out and saying, do we really want to do this? Do we want to knock down a building that is standing? I looked at it. It's not sagging or anything. The grader's sitting out in the rain. It could fit in that building really nice. it just be a lot of space around it. And the lot is jammed up against the road with uh, water behind it, so we can't really expand the lot to be big enough to do the... Um, what the town needs for a facility to run the road crew out of. And maybe we should be looking at buying a piece of land somewhere. You know, I fly around and East Montpier is pretty big. There's a lot of roads and there's a lot of space. So if we're gonna spend millions of dollars, let's not do it dumb. And um, I'm concerned about details like we're going to put the building up against the road so that the solar panels can go on the roof. Well, that means the doors are going to be in the shade, and you really want the doors facing south so that they're melted off and the sun can shine in. And I know the energy guys are, you know, they're all about making sure that we do it according to the newfangled way, but I'm a shop guy, I and mean, you want to open the door and let the heat in on the floor when you can. And... Uh, you want that south-facing exposure for the, where you're working. And then there's this other piece where you really don't want to have the trucks or whatever it is that you're taking care of uh, stored in the space that you're fixing them in. It's just not how we do it. You know, if you go up to the airport, they're not fixing planes in the hangar where the planes are stored. They, they go out there in some big building that's maybe heated just a little bit, but the shop space should be just that. It, we should have a really nice workshop for these guys to fix dump trucks in that you 
you bring in a dump truck that's already thawed out and washed off, and then they fix it. And the building that the vehicles are stored in should be kept at just above freezing so that corrosion is at a minimum and it reduces the amount of energy it takes to heat the basically dump trucks full of sand that they fill up the night before so that they're all ready to go at five in the morning. And, uh, and then there's this last piece of, we wanna, they wanna heat this building with electricity. And I know I'm old, but I remember when they were talking about energy that's gonna be too cheap to meter, and I'm very skeptical about the heat pump wave that's coming our way, and uh, it just seems like um, I have doubt. I'm not certain, though. I, I, I doubt my own doubt, <laughs> which makes it really hard for me to stand up here and make proclamations. So um, these guys are working really hard, and I think it's important that we tell the architects what we want and make sure that it's the right thing and don't tell them what we don't want because they'll give it to us. And uh, I guess I'll shut up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Betsy, Betsy Barstow had her hand up and then I him after that. Betsy, is there a microphone for Betsy, please, folks? Thank you. So Betsy Barstow, and my original question was how you decided which architectural firm to go with, but was it just Good a matter question. you only had one applicant? No, no. Or you had, okay, that's what I want to know. So we had, a, we had an informational walkthrough uh, back in November. We had eight, was it eight firms? I think we had eight uh, representatives of firms show up at the town garage. So then we did a walkthrough, and then we had requests for bids, and we had four uh, firms respond with bids. And then uh, we met um, John Jewett, myself, Andy Shapiro, and a woman that we hired to help us go through the whole process and we winnowed it down to one. We did that because um, the firm that we chose was the most qualified to lead us on this plan. Um, they have a lot of experience with building other garages and they're local, they, they're from Barrie. Um, the two brothers that run the firm, uh, the father was a builder, so they're really hands-on. And um, they were also the cheapest, which was, we don't always hire the cheapest because the cheapest is not always the best, but they happened to be the cheapest and they were the most responsive. So that's how we got the firm. And they were significantly less money, over $20,000 less, almost 30, than the nearest um, other firm, because we, we narrowed it down to two. We had four, we narrowed it down to two. Then we interviewed both and then we took the one. So that's how the process worked. And it, I think it worked pretty well. You know, Andy was at the meetings. He asked a lot of good questions. I did myself. John Jewett, when he was here, was too. He's had a lot of experience with buildings. He used to be the town manager in Hardwick. So I think it worked out pretty well. So that's how it happened. Okay. Kim Watson um, <coughs> had her hand up. And then Chris. You have to stand up if you're not going to use the mic anyway, Kim. I can't get it. There you go. Um, I have a question. Does the firm have good references? As in, have they completed other buildings? Yes. And, and of course, um, the most important person to ask is Guthrie. You know, how does he feel about the new construction and working under those circumstances? Yep. Can you use the mic? Yeah, well, well we I'm asking too. if he wants me. Do you want me to give a little context on this? Sure. 
Um, I can give a little context on our interaction with the architects because I meet with them every time Guthrie does as well. So not only are they wonderful to work with, I have been very impressed and just for anybody that knows, I, I maybe come from a finance background but I come from a construction background. So these are meetings I'm actually very quite comfortable in and happy to be in. Um, one, they're listening to everything that we are, everything we're asking for in the building. From an, they are looking at it from an energy efficiency perspective, from any requests that they are asking us, bringing us ideas. They're not moving forward with anything on their own. Um, they are asking for our feedback at every step of the way. Guthrie and I actually drove and met with the architect at two buildings that they designed in the town of Georgia and the town of Grand Isle. One is steel, one is wood, because we don't know which direction we're going to go partly because wood is more energy efficient, more sustainable, but we're not sure if it's practical for our site. Um, so Guthrie is involved in every meeting. Um, he's included on every email, as is Andy Shapiro as well, um, because Andy's looking at it from an energy efficiency perspective. So just so you know, yes, Guthrie is highly involved. Guthrie is the main person <laughs> that provides feedback about this project and how it relates and how it's gonna be efficient for the road crew. But um, I can't say enough about WLA, Wyman, Lamphere, and Associates is who we hired as the architect. They have been incredible to work with. So, but yes, Guthrie is, Guthrie is the key man for this. Maybe it's already been said, but uh, Guthrie Perry is the road foreman in town. Chris Pratt had a question. Steve, for what Steve Miracle just said, um, I'm also in construction with windows and restoration of and weatherization of windows. Um, spent my life studying climate change and working on these issues. And energy efficiency and carbon are two different things. So I would, I would really recommend that they do a carbon analysis, not an energy analysis. They're doing that. That's well, been done. The, and they come up with the fact that it's more carbon efficient to tear a building down and build a new one? Because I think that is that, insane. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, okay. if they, I'd love to see that, because that, that's something everybody will say, the greenest building is the one that exists. And you have operational carbon, and then you have embedded carbon. Okay. And so, de I mean, I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but that, that is an issue that needs to be fully vetted. And everybody who's in the building wants to build new. And everybody loves new buildings. And architects love new buildings. Nobody wants to fix an old building. So they're all biased towards tearing this thing down. Just, just my point of view. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. We had a question there. State your name, please. Sorry. And then uh, Ed. Carol Dixon. Um, this is a related question. Is there a sense that any of the materials in the building can be repurposed or reused or sold? Um, we've discussed that as far as repurposing goes. So we haven't really come to that moment where we've hired somebody to take down the building. But that has been on the table as far as repurposing the material. So I, wanted, I just want to reassure you that that's something that we've talked about and we will continue to do so as we move forward. Ed Deegan had a, his hand up. Just to note, Ed was not present this morning when we introduced the candidates. He was out working the tables. Ed is running for auditor. Ed, go ahead with your questions regarding Article 3. Um, so I'm on the capital budget. Uh, the, we're, we're talking about this as being some new thing that's just come up. This has been ongoing for since a decade or more that, that this has been uh, a need of the town. I'm a very big fiscal pragmatist, and renovating is often more expensive for less benefit than building new. It just is. And I've, I own multiple properties. Trust me, uh, um, Seth is my neighbor, so to speak, on one of his properties. My wife will tell you, and she's a CPA, MBA, that we should have bulldozed that property and, and rebuilt from scratch because I put so much work into it. And I'm still working on it. I've been working on it for 35 years. It's never ending. Uh, a new energy efficient building is the way to go. But as the fiscal pragmatist and, and the capital budget side of this thing is, um, 
the goal of all boards and that we serve is the capital budget, the, the select board, is to safeguard the assets of the organization of the town. We have millions of dollars in assets sitting over there. We need to protect all those vehicles and, and give uh, uh, Guthrie the, the resources he needs. We shouldn't be buying, you know, a 200,000, and every time I turn around, you know, it's getting more and more expensive. Uh, you can't be leaving, you know, these vehicles uh, without a good aspect of service. So this thing has been ongoing for a while. I'm fully supporting uh, the direction that we're going. I do understand where everybody's coming from with the renovation, be, be fiscally pragmatic, but uh, a lot of thought has gone into this. This isn't something that they just came up with, like to spend taxpayers' money. This is going to long-term benefit the town and safeguard our assets and, and be more fiscally responsible. Any other questions or comments, uh, Jean Troya? Pages, uh, Jean's right there with the microphone. Did we lose our microphones? Seems like there's one being run around. One being run around, okay. Hi, Gene Troya. Um, I want... Mic up more, okay. Um, I want to echo some of the things Ed said. Um, one, this, looking at the town garage and what needs to be done with it, um, the town has been looking at that for 10 or 12 years anyway. Um, and it's good to see that it's now um, starting to move forward finally. Um, I've also been a builder for a long time. Um, I've renovated a lot of historic buildings in and around Montpelier, and I've built a lot of new energy efficient buildings in and around Montpelier. Um, I'd like to say that in terms of protecting our tax base and protecting what we're gonna pay to support this place going forward, I think we're going to be better off putting up a new structure. Um, I've been in the old pole barn. Um, that's the original part of the garage. And there really isn't much there in terms of um, energy efficiency. Um, it's a lightweight slab on grade, um, which is going to be really difficult to heat as it is now, but it's going to continue to be difficult over time. Um, if you look at the furnace in that building, um, it's probably older than Ed Deegan or I. Uh, <laughs> and that's pretty old, right. Um, so I would like to say that we should try and be as efficient um, in terms of energy, in terms of space, in terms of building enough space. Um, <clears throat> the new fire department building was brought up. And when we built it, it looked like this giant thing um, that was way too big. And if you go down there now, some of the new fire trucks barely fit in the bays. Um, and we need to be looking at that. You look at the old garage, town garage, and it's not wide enough for the dump trucks with the wings on them. Forget about the road grader. Uh, and I also, so that being said, I have a question on scope of work. Um, when we look at this new building and know that we're already storing some equipment in the old fire department building there, are you looking at taking down that fire department building and combining spaces? Um, are you looking at wastewater on the site? I know there's not a lot of septic there, um, but is it an issue that we're going to address in this project? Yeah. And those so, are my questions. Okay. <laughs> so the wastewater aspect is definitely has to be addressed. So it will be addressed. We have to probably drill a new well, and we have to identify the existing septic system, which we're working on. Right. That's a good question. Now, as far as the original fire department building, Station number one, which is adjacent to the town garage. Um, I have brought that up as far as combining that space and perhaps taking down that building. Uh, that option doesn't seem to be 
uh, I'd like to say well received, but maybe that's not the right word, but it seemed to be off the table kind of quickly. But I can bring that back up because that was definitely my thought, is to get rid of the building and combine space with a new building. Um, so that would be my preferred thought, but I'm not sure that <clears throat> is acceptable to fire department. And it wasn't when I brought it up. So that's the answer. Now, there are wastewater issues to deal with that building as the town garage. So that hasn't been completely addressed. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Right. Gene, would you repeat the right. question, please, just so the... Uh, well, Gene was just... I, I, I was yeah. just commenting that if yeah. that building, if you were tearing down the existing garage, if you also removed that building, yeah. it gives you a lot more site to work with yeah. in terms of citing a new building right. in terms of maximum passive solar yeah. gain, yeah. stuff like that. That's, this is all true, Gene. Um, but that was an option that I put out there, and it didn't seem like that was gaining much traction. Uh, but I can definitely put it out there again just to see where we're at on that. But I, I want to tell you that that option definitely been looked at. Can I do one more question while sure. we're on this? Sure, one more. Um, over time, there had been some talk that the state was going to, at some point, require that towns cover their sand piles. No. Is that something still? That's, that was not the word that I have received. You can ask Gina about that, but I haven't heard okay. anything about that. And the sand pile <laughs> issue seemed to be resolved as far as proximity to the stream goes. So it doesn't seem like we have an issue there. As we move forward with the design of the new building, we're making sure that we have room for material, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of a whole holistic plan on the whole site um, to stack material, access to the building, the garage doors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. Bruce Howlett. Thanks, Gene. Bruce Howlett, right there. I want to follow up a little on what Gene just asked about the scope of work for this project. And so working with the construction management firm and the architect, you've given them some general specifications for what to do. And so I'd be interested, I mean, the town, I presume, has done an inventory of the needs that are to be addressed with this building. Yeah. Um, and granted, all this is still preliminary and draft, but it would probably be, uh, it would be interesting to see this and to maybe put a brief description of this on the town website so that we know the scale of what we're talking about here. It's on the, it's on the town website. Yeah. So everything that we have so far is on the town website. Including the RFP. Including, the yeah. Specs. Yeah. See, yeah, there's another hand up. Yep. Yeah, uh, anyone else uh, before I call on Kim again, then looks like Edith. Uh, Kim Watson, right there. Could you please stand? Here comes the page with the mic. Just to clarify, um, we'll have a lot of, you know, possibly a forum once the designs come out and stuff to c comment. I just want to know that process. So we'll before even thinking of going to a bond or anything like that, we'll have a lot of communication to the community, correct? Yeah, the architectural <laughs> firm that we've hired is gonna help us with the presentations, the informational meetings, et cetera. And we still have to talk whether the town representative is gonna be involved in that process too, but I think so. Um, so there'll be, there'll be meetings, warn meetings uh, um, about this as we move along in the process. Edie Miller had a question or comment. I, I wanted to go back to Steve Miracle's comments about the site. Have those been, have, have you addressed or looked at the things that he talked about, the limitations of the site itself? Uh, yep. Yeah. We've talked about the site. Actually, there, we talked about moving the site completely. The thing that happens, though, when you start developing new sites is you, you run into huge expenses, much more. It would significantly add to the cost of the project. And we feel that if we can do 
the new garage on the existing project without compromising the design of the building, that it's, it's gonna save the taxpayers a lot of money and there aren't any drawbacks with the site. It's a good place for us to operate for multiple reasons. So there really hasn't been a good reason to move away from the site uh, because we haven't compromised what we need to do. If we ran into significant compromises, we would have to move the site. But I'm just warning you that when you start moving away from that site, you run into increased costs quickly and a huge delay in implementing the plan. So we did look at another site and it was very quickly determined that that was gonna be hugely expensive and problematic to develop. Um, so that's, this is why we're on the existing site, but I can assure you that if it looks like we're gonna have to compromise, then we will definitely look at other options. Any other, uh, Rick Barstow. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Rick Barstow. Um, I'm wondering, is there any possibility we looked into possibly expanding the land footprint there a little bit, um, whether that next property owner might be willing to um, sell off a little bit of land to make that area a little bigger and help accommodate what we want to build? So, so the thing is that the site is surrounded by wetlands and the town forest. Okay, so we own the land around the existing site. We already own it. But the thing is, there is some room for expansion on the site, but not a lot, because we did, um, we had a wetlands engineer come in, and I myself, and also Carl, walked around the site, and we delineated um, some area that we could move into if we needed to. But there isn't a lot of room there, because the wetlands aspect of it. Any other questions or comments regarding the article of discussion with respect to the town garage plan? Anyone else? Hearing none, seeing none, we're moving on to Article 4. Article 4, shall the town raise the sum of $2,261,263 as proposed by the select board for laying out highways and other necessary town expenses for fiscal year 2025, which begins on July 1st. This is by Australian ballot, and the polls are open from 7 until 7. Article 5, shall the town authorize all property taxes for fiscal year 25 to be paid to the town treasurer without discount in two installments, I'm paraphrasing, on or before November 15th, 2024, and on or before being postmarked on or before Thursday, May 15, 2025. Is there a motion to adopt Article 5? There is one by Loring Starr, seconded by Kim Watson, uh, and also Bob Murray. All those in favor of Article, oh, is there any discussion regarding Article 5? Comment. If not, all those in favor of adopting Article 5, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Article 6, shall the town raise the sum of $51,960 for Kellogg Hubbard Library for the support of the library, again, to be voted by Australian ballot. There is a report from our representative on page 80, I believe, no, it might be 70, uh, in the town report, it's there. Um, there is, a, is the representative here just to speak briefly because this is an Australian ballot item, a public question and the Kellogg Hubbard Library is on 86. Any questions, comments? Can't have much discussion because it's Australian ballot. Yes, one person, thank you. Are you Sarah? Yes, I Margaret. am. Sarah, hi, you just state your name. Hi, I'm Sarah Swift. I'm the trustee for Kellogg Hubbard Library from East Montpelier. And uh, there is an increase in, in um, our ask this year. Um, there hasn't been an increase in a couple of years. And uh, um, it's not, it's mostly due to uh, increase in benefits for the uh, library staff. And um, the flood, we had $1.5 million in damage. Um, we, mostly in the basement, the library was opened back up to, um, uh, 
to circulation uh, quite quickly a week after the flood. Uh, we had a tent on the front lawn, as uh, may maybe some of you know. Uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, rebuilding the basement in a sustainable way from the flood, uh, and that is underway. The library has been fully open since uh, October, with the exception of um, the book sale, which we hope to redo in the summer, and, uh, and um, the elevator, so we're not fully accessible, but that will be by the summer, too. Does anybody have any questions for me? Thank you, Sarah. It's great. Again, that's by Australian ballot. Article 7, shall the town raise the sum of $4,500 for the Four Corners Schoolhouse Association for operating expenses during fiscal year 2025? Is there a motion to adopt Article 7? Hillary Farrington, seconded by Ellen Knadler. Any discussion regarding the Four Corners School vote on Article 7? Rachel Grossman. In the back. Thank you. So in the absence of our fearless leader, Hobie Guyon, he asked me to speak to the town. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Rachel Grossman, and I am the, um, on the Four Corners Schoolhouse. I act um, currently as the role of treasurer. Um, and so I just, we just really want to take this opportunity to thank the town for the matching grant. Um, we have been piecing together the schoolhouse for umpteen years, um, patching up here, patching up there, trying to fix this mold issue, trying to fix this window and that window, and... Um, amazing members of the board, and I am not one of those, crawled around in the basement with God knows what to remove God knows what. Um, and, it's, and now we have the funding to really do this right. And so, um, and, and this was, um, the, the impetus for this was more and more people were complaining about a mold as they came into the schoolhouse. And there were people who just don't, come to the schoolhouse and use the schoolhouse because of the mold problem. So we really wanted to protect this wonderful historical building that we have. And thanks to the town, we have a grant and the very generous donations of townspeople, we have enough money to complete this project and hopefully um, we will do so by, you know, hopefully by summer or soon thereafter. We will be ready and open for business and you can look forward to a grand opening. Thank you, Rachel. Any questions or discussions regarding Article 7, the Four Corners School? If not, all those in favor of Article 7, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. You have adopted Article 7. Article 8, shall the town raise the sum of $12,000 for the East Montpelier signpost to provide for the production and mailing of six issues of the signpost for each East Montpelier resident during fiscal year 2025. Is there a motion to adopt Article 8, Bob Morey, seconded by Rachel Grossman? Any discussion, comments, questions regarding the signpost article, Article 8? Ellen Knadler. Ellen Knadler, I just want to uh, thank the people who get the signpost out because uh, I look forward to it every two months, and in our house it's referred to as the gossip scandal sheet. An excellent gossip <laughs> scandal sheet. Thank you, Ellen. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Just state your name for the record, I'm sorry. Charlotte Staples. Um, I have to say that I go back to the signpost back to 1990 when I was part of the first group that worked on it for the first, I did for the first six years. Anyway, my light table was my patio door when I did the layout. Um, so my question is, 
looking at their financial statement on page 66, 67, they have said that their costs are $9,000 for the year. They have more than enough for two years. And I'm just wondering, could they explain why they chose to continue the, uh, asking for another 12000 Thank you. Rachel, sorry, I was just looking on page 80, excuse me, 66, 67. Okay, go ahead, thanks. I get to answer that question too because I do the books for the signpost. Um, so the reason that our request is at $12,000, um, it's probably my fault. Um, <laughs> but um, we are rectifying that. What happened was I took over the books in 2019 and I looked at what we were <clears throat> asking for and we had plenty of money in the bank. And I went to the signpost people and I said, we don't need to ask for any money. We've got plenty of money in the bank. Um, so we didn't. And what I failed to know um, is that we don't get the town monies until December. So it looks like we have plenty of money in the bank, but we're going to spend half of that or close to half of that before we get our next infusion from the bank. So the signpost, since it has started, has um, tried to keep two years' worth of operating expenses in our budget. And so that year, there was a jump um, from one year to the next from a request of... I don't know, 9,000 to 12,000, something like that. Um, and so we've been requesting that 12,000 and through, you know, um, we, we have recovered and we're at the point now where we need to look at it again for our next year's request because <clears throat> this is the first year that we can comfortably look at the budget and say, yes, we've got the two year um, cushion. But it's, it's, um, that $20,000 or $23,000, we, we won't get the 12,000 that the town gives us until December. So that's where the, um, that's why it looks like it's way more than what we need. Thank you, Rachel. Any other questions? And thank you, Sherry, for your question. Uh, Ann Stanton. I just wanted to remind folks that during the, I believe it was one of the years during the pandemic, we didn't ask for any money at all. So um, we, we try to be super uh, pragmatic and cautious and frugal and all the rest of that. Thanks, Ann. Any other questions or comments regarding the signpost article? Rachel, one more, please. Thank the, you. The other reason to be cautious is that the price, the cost of paper and printing has, we don't know what's going to happen with those costs. Um, they, they are rising. I mean, I went to buy a ream of paper and it was $14 at Staples. So I'm sure we're not paying that much to Old Brown, but um, we're just being conservative on that. So. Thanks, Rachel. Any other questions or comments regarding... Article 8, seeing none, hearing none. All those in favor of adopting Article 8, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The motion carries. Article 9, shall the town raise the sum of $4,000 for East Montpelier Trails for enhancement, development, and administration during fiscal year 2025? Is there a motion to take up Article Nine, Becky Reed, as there a second to that motion, Ed Deegan, Richard Brock told me he could speak if there was need for someone to speak, unless there's someone in the audience who can speak, and Nona Estrin, are you available to address any questions or concerns regarding Article 9? You need to, uh, if, you, if you could stand up and use a microphone. You're both available. Okay, I thought you were going to. Ed, do you have a question? And then Loring. Uh, just a little input. Uh, I look at the trails as a real asset to the community. It's a real benefit to have them. 
And with climate change, uh, if everybody believes in climate change, and I certainly do, uh, these trails have had really rough time in the last couple of years. Uh, whole sections of the vast trail were shut down this year because so many trees came down in December. And so we got to support these, these people. And a lot of volunteer work goes into maintaining these trails, and it's a huge asset. So uh, thank you all for, for doing uh, the work that, that goes out there. But uh, 4,000, I think if it was 8,000, 10,000, I would be still supporting it um, because these trails are getting a lot of wear and tear from climate change. And it's just something we have to deal with. Loring Starr. Loring Star, I'm a trail steward for a very small piece of the system. I, to echo Ed Deegan, I am really, really tired of trees falling down on the trails. Because of that, I would like to do a shout out for all the trail fairies who cut up trees anonymously and help clear our trails. So a shout out for that. Any other questions or comments regarding Article 9? Uh, Nona Esther. Hi. I just I said this last year, and I'm going to say it again this year. Um, there's nothing like uh, having a small, aging group of volunteers that uh, do this kind of work and going out on a crew and finding that it's already been done by who knows whom. Uh, we appreciate that more than we can say. However, there are landowners who uh, make an important <clears throat> part of their income from, from taking occasional very fine trees. And if those go down, uh, if you see a beautiful tree with a long, we used to call that the boar, big enough for boards, um, perhaps it's best to check with the landowner. Not perhaps. Please, check with the landowner before you cut. Any other questions or comments regarding the trails article? Seeing none, hearing none. All those in favor of Article 9, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. The article passes. Article 10, shall the town raise the sum of $9,700 for the Montpelier Senior Activity Center for operating expenses during fiscal year 2025, is there a motion to adopt Article 10 regarding the Senior Center? Uh, looks like Doug Kivet Kellar and Floor Diaz Smith seconding Article 10. Any questions or discussion regarding Article 10, the Senior Center? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor of adopting Article 10, please indicate by saying aye. All those opposed say nay. The article passes. Article 11, shall the town raise the sum of $6,000 for Twin Valley seniors for operating expenses during your fiscal 2025? Is there a motion to adopt Article 10? Selena Moore, seconded by Ginny Callan. Any questions or discussion regarding Article 11? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor of adopting Article 11, Twin Valley Seniors, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The article is passed. Article 12, shall the town raise the sum of $6,500 for Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice for operating expenses during fiscal year 2025? Is there a motion to adopt or to take up? Article 12, one by Renee Kilbet Killar. Oh, Lindy, hi. <laughs> Lindy Biggs and seconded by Tom Brazier. Any questions, discussions regarding Article 12? Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor of Article 12, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Article 12 is adopted. Article 13, shall the, sum, shall the town raise the sum of $7,834 for support of rural community transportation? I will paraphrase, this is the service 
ongoing commuter bus along Route 12 with service into East Montpelier and $1,000 therein for the share of the cost of providing the commuter bus along Route 14 and 15 going north into East Montpelier. Route two, route 2 was the first part, it's 68. The, uh, the 1,000 is for 14 and 15 routes. Article 13, is there a motion to adopt Article 13, is that Rachel? Yes. And seconded by Becky Reed. Any discussion or questions regarding Article 13 for rural community transportation, $7,834? Yes, ma'am. Uh, page, is there a page for right here? Coming down the aisle, thank you. Just state your name for the record. I'm Margaret Grant, um, Cummings Road, and my question is whether um, the Transportation Agency has any plans to come up County Road. Maybe take a loop around Horn of the Moon, go right by my house. Right by your house. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that could make the difference between people being able to stay in their houses longer as they're no longer able to drive. Is anyone available to answer Margaret's question? Carl? Um, actually, they don't have any plans at the moment. Um, one of the holdbacks from ridership in my estimation, well, from expanding routes, is they don't have a robust number of people riding on the bus. Um, and it's heavily subsidized as it is. So they are working with limited funds, and ridership is, hasn't been growing exponentially. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I talk to folks in public transportation on relocalizing Vermont, uh, my radio show, quite a bit, and the way that they explain the process of getting new routes is that um, they sort of start out easing into it. Uh, a lot of the routes are around commuting. And they start in with a commuter van that's subsidized by the state. And if there's a lot of take up of that, then they look at putting in a, a new bus route. But um, I ha haven't heard anything about that particular route. So, but, but if you're interested, uh, then you know, talk to your neighbors and um, you know, see if people want to get together a commuter van to go somewhere, and then you could put in for some money for that. So, so Carl, I just want to ask you: Do you think that there? Do you think that the ridership is growing? Because I haven't gotten. I, I, not much. Well, COVID really uh, yeah, took heard a it. big bite out of it. And I asked that question yeah. at the meeting because they come in every year and give the report. And the answer that we got was kind of vague. It wasn't that ridership was really growing. And I, and I think because, you know, I sh probably shouldn't say this, but because fossil fuels are relatively cheap, people are not moving into mass transportation as quickly as some of us would like. Is that correct? I agree. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, Edie Miller had her hand up for a question or comment. Uh, I am always confused by this article and the next one, both of which talk about a commuter commuter service on Route Two. Could you explain? Uh, are they overlapping? Are they the same? What What's the deal? Could uh, anyone answer this question, which melds into Article 14? Sure. If, if you hang out by Route 2 and watch the buses go by, you'll notice some red buses go by and some white or multicolor white, blue, green buses go by. So both RCT operating out of the St. J area and the Green Mountain Transit operating out of uh, our area and other, other place, Chittenden County, um, they, they share that route. And so we are paying some money to uh, both agencies. But, but she's asking, do they overlap? The, they, they don't it, really. I don't, I it's, think they it's, coordinate, it's, don't they? They, they coordinate, yeah. yeah. They aren't competing with each other. Yeah, the, so the, they don't overlap. Does that answer your question, Edie? Well, on one hand, you're saying that um, the, the bus service is on the RCT route, but on the other hand, is not great. I just don't understand the, uh, the how, how we need two, or do they service different things, 
or what? It, it's just that some of the buses on this service, you could think of them as one article, um, because some of the buses on the service originate in St. J, and some of them originate in near Montpelier, and they just go back and forth. But so it's, a, it's the same coordinated service. We're just uh, being asked to pay two different organizations to do it. Is but it, they are they are coordinated. Is absolutely. that what you're saying? That's absolutely. that's my point. I yes. just want to make sure we're not we don't have low ridership and yet people are competing to do it. No, no. They they look at ridership. Uh, they look at times that people are using it and so okay. on. And they coordinate together. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank thank you for helping us to clarify that. Thank you, uh, Edie and Carl. Kim Watson. Um, I just wanted to clarify some of that. The RTC, RCT really goes around the Route 2, 14, 15 area where the Green Mountain Transit will do the Burlington routes and things like that as well. But they coordinate coming to certain locations. Thank you. Any other well, questions? Ginny Callan. If, if, if I well, may, I'm sorry, Carl. Go if ahead. I may clarify, yes. Sure. So, so that is true, and what we're being asked to vote on is for the service along Route 2 for RCT at, at, at this point, plus, uh, as the moderator said, $1,000 for their service on Route 14 and 15 that comes into to Mont, uh, to East Montpelier. Ginny. Article 13. Uh, and aside is that I know there's a, a new organization starting up called Gopher Vermont, and they will be doing ride services for people in our area. It's, uh, they're a nonprofit, and they are particularly interested in serving low-income residents and bringing them to doctor's appointments and grocery shopping and all kinds of things. So that's something new that's just kicking out. Thanks, Jeannie. Any other questions or comments? Regarding Article 13, Loring Star, please. Loring Star, um, in terms of County Road, I'm just thinking if you build it, they will come. And maybe I'm naive, but think of all those lovely people in Callis who could drive, ride the bus. I would have loved to have had a bus going to work. But also in terms of senior rides, Green Mountain Transit does now offer a a free senior rides service. You sign up, you call them, you say, I need a ride next Tuesday. They pick you up at home, they take you, they pick you up and bring you back home. And it's usually works really, really well. Okay, but that aspect of the service is under the Article 15. Okay. Yeah. And may, may I respond to that? Yes, you may. Yes. Uh, so I... I Thank you. If you if uh, you build it, they will come. I, I would turn that around uh, in line with my earlier comments and say, if you build it, they will come. If local people, grassroots, say, hey, we want a commuter van here, then they'll give you money for that. And then if a lot of people are using that, then they'll talk about building routes around that same route, bus routes around that same route. Article 13, RCT. Any other questions or comments? Before we vote on the motion, all those in favor of Article 13, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have adopted Article 13. <coughs> Article 14, related uh, and touched on. Shall the town raise the sum of $1,499 as its Green Mountain Transit portion for fiscal year 2025 uh, along Route 2. Is there a motion to adopt Article 14? Renee Carpenter, is there a second to Renee's motion? <coughs> Becky Reed, uh, discussion or questions? Yes, sir, Mr. Grant. Grant, is that? Thompson. Thompson, okay. Thank you. Just a point of clarification. Why are both of these numbers for the transportation funding odd numbers? Why aren't they even numbers? <laughs> Sounds like a question for Ed Deegan. But, uh... Good question. Does anyone have an answer to Mr. Thompson's question about the numbers? An amendment but to add one dollar is in order. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Does that, do you oppose it? Did you, do you propose that amendment? 
Mr. Thompson <laughs> proposes to add a dollar to Article 14 to have it read uh, $1,500. Is there a second to Mr. Thompson's motion? Will Duane. Any discussion with regard to Article 14 as amended? <laughs> Hearing none, seeing none. All those in favor of Article 14 as amended uh, to no, the, the oh, amendment. Carl? Uh, we're voting on the amendment first. Well, there's um, two ways to do it. But if uh, we, we could do that. Yeah. All those in favor of the amendment of $1, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed to adding a dollar. Nay. <laughs> the ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. You have amended Article 14, and now we go to the principal article, which is Article 14 as amended. All those in favor of Article 14 as amended, unless there's any additional discussion, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it and you have adopted Article 14 as amended. Article 15, which is on page 10, and before we start getting close to the end, I wanted to thank our pages again from the East Montpelier Elementary School for their work. But we might have a bit of a discussion on this, and I also want to take the opportunity to thank again Colin McCaffrey for the excellent sound system. although this is, has 33 subparts. <laughs> Article 15, shall the town raise the amounts listed below as recommended by the study committee for the following organizations for fiscal year 2025, the total being 23,006, excuse me, $23,916. Is there a motion to adopt Article 15 as printed on page 10? Is a is that Julie? Uh, Julie Potter. Julie Potter and Kim Watson, first and second, respectively. Any discussion, or is there anyone who can maybe even address uh, the committee? Uh, we may not have any questions, but um, I'll leave it open uh, if anyone has to, a comment or a question. Paul, Earl Baum. Thank you. Only if someone has a question. There's a question. There's a question in the back row. Oh, Please state your name for the, your, the record. Hi, my name is Ashley Hellman. And I'm just wondering why we're giving money to Green Mountain Transit again. Can anyone answer ans uh, yeah. Ashley's question? I can answer that. Seth. So this is a separate service. It's not the bus service that goes on Route 2 or goes to Burlington. This is a service that picks up seniors, goes to the houses, brings, brings people to appointments, et cetera, et cetera. It's a little bus that goes around the neighborhood taking care of that aspect. It's nothing to do with the commuter bus that's on Route 2, Route 14, going to Burlington, et cetera, et cetera. It's a completely separate service. So that's why it's in this article, okay? Any other questions uh, regarding Article 15 that Paul may be able to answer? Renee and then Charles. Um, I think that bus is also the bus that picks up seniors and drops them off at the senior center. I'm pretty sure that's this extra. Um, it's not extra, it's just a different program. And I just want to appreciate the committee that vets all of these organizations and also all of these organizations, most of which function by volunteers. And so the little amount that they're asking for from the towns does is amplified by all of the volunteers and so it's like we are so fortunate to live in central Vermont and have all of these organizations supported by all of the people who come out to make sure that they function on a very minimal budget. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Duly noted. Charles Johnson, you had your hand up. 
Yeah. Uh, yes, Charles Johnson. I uh, bring your attention to uh, number 33. A few years ago, I questioned why uh, boys and girls in this age of gender neutrality that were spelled differently. And I'm pleased to see that they dealt with my concern by renaming the whole organization. So, just. There you go. Um, just, just before we proceed any further on this, I just want to give a brief synopsis of why there's 33 different organizations under one heading of the funding requests. So this, was, this process to, was developed years ago to make it more efficient rather than have every one of these under a separate article. They were lumped together in one big article and because there are so many small requests. Now we had to keep it under 25,000 because the rule in the town is if it's over 25,000, you have to vote by Australian ballot. So this way we keep it on the floor under 25,000 and we can discuss it openly. It's a lot harder to do that when it's on Australian ballot. Now, the other thing that does happen is once what happens every year is we get um, asked by the funding committee, how should we handle additional requests and bumping up this and that. So they vet, the funding request committee vets every one of these requests. And occasionally what happens is a bigger organization starts to bump the whole total over 25,000. So what we've done in the past, that big organization that bumped it over 25 will get moved under its own article. So we always keep it under the 25,000. And you know, every request, once again, does get vetted by the volunteer funding request study committee. They do their homework, they bring that back to the select board with their decisions, and we look it over also. So I just want everyone to feel reassured that this isn't just rubber stamped. This is looked at carefully every year. If, if I may fill yep. in a little bit. So oh, oh. be careful then. <laughs> <laughs> so you can you can look at the articles from Article Six on as part of the same process, but with two different parallel tracks. So uh, these are all similar sorts of organizations, but because we years ago set that $25,000 ceiling here at town meeting for what we'd consider on the floor, then as, as the chair described, we have uh, broken out certain ones of those. And the ones that don't go to the funding request study committee for their careful vetting work, uh, those organizations come to the select board and make a request to be put on the ballot. So everybody that you're being asked to vote on an appropriation for has been vetted by the town in one way or another. And actually, for this article, Article 15, they've been vetted twice because the funding request study committee makes a recommendation to the select board. Yeah. Thanks. Bob Morey. Could someone on the committee explain to me what the Vermont Bar Foundation is and why their request is 10% of the total budget here? I don't understand what the Vermont Bar Association does and what it, how it benefits us here in this room. Can anyone answer Mr. Maury's question? Yeah. Ruben? Oh, good. oh, you have a question. You, you have the same, Ruben has, Ruben Bennett has the same question. Thank you. Paul, Bob, could you? <laughs> yes. Uh, w one thing that's worth noting, can you hear me? <clears throat> is that for each request, each of these, is it 33 requests? Yes. We find out how many people in town have been served by this outfit. That's a, maybe the most important consideration. Uh, but as far as the Bar Foundation, they in turn fund legal aid the legal services organization that helps people throughout the state and a lot of people here in East Montpelier with free legal services. Does that answer the question? Because they get their funding through the Bar Foundation. That's just their source. Okay. Uh, uh, Ruben, does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, Nathan Phillips had his hand up. served 
148 East Montpelier residents. Okay, thank you. Oh. All right, um, Article 15, the 33 subsets. Any other questions, comments that anyone wants to make Donald Welch? Oh. And then, oh, Diana Fielder shot short stopped you, so. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Diana, please. Thank you, and I just want to thank the residents of East Montpelier for supporting the Onion River Food Shelf every year at town meeting, and also the individuals from this town that volunteer their time and their resources to continue to serve many, many households at the Onion River Food Shelf. During the month of February, we served over 100 households. That is close to 300 people that we fed during the month of February. And our hours have now gone to nine to two because we could not handle the overload in a short time span of only four hours, so we're now five, and we're there every Wednesday from nine to two, run by volunteers, many from East Montpelier. Thanks, Diane. Donald Welch uh, had his hand up in the back row there, and I see Dave Connor with his hand up as well. Donald. Don Welch. Uh, I just wanted to add a historical perspective a little bit here, because if you, any of you have been here that long, when this was started, we were discussing every, every article and just going through the process of reading and so forth and everyone being presented. And then we went to this combined article, which is good. I just want to remind people that this can be split. You, if you have a particular argument with the amount that's been there can be increased or decreased, I believe that that was the original intent. I assume that's still yeah. a possibility. It is. It is. There, there, there has always been this sort of unwritten tradition that you can't amend something that's in the warning, but you can't. State law does allow that. Yeah, we've, we've done it before. We've done it before. We yeah. did it today. Yeah, yeah. we did it yeah. today. That was a different. Yeah. Uh, Dave Connor has his uh, hand up. I know, aren't they doing a great job? This category is the category when I was the director of the Lamoille Family Center that we sent all our staff to all the town meetings. If each one of them had gone to the town meetings early and asked for a certain amount representative of all the different services that Lamoille Family Center prepared in, in about five to ten counties around us, our staff would not have been able to cover it all. So the fact that it could be lumped together is an action that saved us many, many things by a little bit from each of the areas helping us continue to serve this, the people that we were serving in the way that we were doing it. Thanks, Dave. Um, yes, ma'am. Could you state your name for the record? I'm sorry. I'm Liz Benjamin. I'm happy to vote for this article. Um, because they've been carefully vetted. I would like some more information on some of these, and maybe we could have some articles in the signpost. Okay, good point. To Don Welch's point, if I may, as a moderator privilege, we used to spend 20 minutes arguing over $2,000, and then there'd be no discussion over a million dollars. It was just... We know anyway. why that is. Anyway, yes. Um, Carol Dixon, I, I don't think you addressed this, um, Seth and, and Carl, but if you did, apologies. So it's getting close to the 25,000 cap, and so if it gets, what would the next step be? Would we be asking for more money um, to be able to approve more money in this item, or would we move some of the items to individuals, or, you know, presumably things are going to need to ask for more money in the next few years. So what happens when it gets closer to the $25,000 cap? So it sounds like there's two parts to your question. So if one of the articles today got amended on the floor, we'd have to keep it below the $25,000 cap today. Now, next year when these articles come up for review, we would have to move one out and be a standalone article. 
to, to keep it below the 25,000. And of course, you know, there's some requests that come in with increase, they need increased funding. And you don't want to just deny it because it's below the 25,000. So then you would have to move one out if you deemed the request worthy of in, in an increase. Does that answer your question? So what do you move one out when you um, ask people to raise the cap? Well, we, we meet every year, and that's the discussion. Is like, well, if you have to move one out, then we'll have to look at that. So that's what happens. Or uh, additional information is <clears throat> the cap used to be $10,000. I think you might have already mentioned yeah. that. And it was no. around uh, 2005 or so that the town decided to raise it from 10000 to 25000 And you know that could be raised at next year's town meeting to raise it to some other number. But it's, it's not all that likely that we'll raise above the 25000 It's a lot more likely we take out a bigger item to keep the other ones below the 25,000 when you sum them up, okay? I mean, in every year, the funding request committee comes into the select board and say, oh, what should we do? And we're like, well, you've got 5% to work with, try to keep it below that, but it's pretty flexible because you may have a request that's gonna bump you over the 25 that would be worthy of consideration, so. Any other questions or comments with regard to Article 15, the funding requests, and the 33 subsets? If not, are you prepared for your vote? All those in favor of Article 15, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. The article is passed. Article 16, to transact any other business that may properly come before the meeting. Uh, nothing binding, uh, just a sec, thanks. Uh, nothing binding, it is, uh, has to be germane to the purposes of the town of East Montpelier. I was approached by the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation uh, to say a few words, um, given the time, and we're right on schedule with the kitchen, it was perfectly coordinated. Um, Abby Jean is here to speak to that. Um, however, is there anyone uh, from the assembly who, yes ma'am. The, and the Stephen uh, Energy Committee, correct? You're gonna speak to that? Okay, um, from the floor, and Renee has her hand up, these have to be germane to the town of East Montpelier, and you have a, 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 a Got it. Okay, so we'll start with Renee with regard to Article 16. Rachel. Standing in line to speak. I'm sorry. You're standing in line. I have something I wanted to bring. Yes, got it. Okay, I think I. So I am speaking for the Friends of Coburn Pond. Uh, pages 76 and 77 in the annual report gives an update for. Um, I don't think we've been before the town since before the pandemic. Um, and as many of you probably know, Coburn Pond took a major hit in July. So um, just wanting to be present, I wrote up most of what needs to be known in terms of an update. And, um, we are in process of updating our main web page, which I think hadn't been updated since 2019. And we uh, definitely will be um, doing a fundraising campaign so that we can continue to um, expand our group. A very small group has been participating with the town on Green Up Day, keeping that area clean. Um, we collaborated with Friends of the Winooski River back in, I think it was September, when they did a massive post-flood river cleanup. And um, we have been in our very grassroots way maintaining um, a tidy property. It's a 76-acre property. It's got the six-acre swimming hole. There's no cost for the hundreds, maybe thousands of people use it 
all year round. So on a hot day, people don't have to pay to picnic. People walk their dogs. People swim their pets. I could tell you stories. But instead of taking up time, um, I'd love for you to look for our web page. Give us another month or so to update it. We have a page linked to the town's community pages online. And um, we would like to now move forward where we dropped off around 2019 and get a full management plan so that the few things that have happened in the past five years are um, more formally addressed. So thank you for the time here. And come out and see it. It's a fun place to be. Stephen uh, Miracle, can you uh, address the other business portions? Of um, I'm a member of the uh, newly reconstituted. It's on. It's on. Um, Energy Committee, and we're working on uh, developing an amendment to the town plan that would count as an enhanced energy plan as described under Act 174, which I think was cooked up by the. Public Utility Commission, and meaning a determination of energy compliance that we put into the town plan will give the town a stronger voice when it comes to citing large renewable energy products, projects, which is important because uh, big corporations can come in and stick in gigantic solar arrays where we might not want them. So we really need to have... Um, some leverage there to protect ourselves. This um, greater weight inciting decisions is described as substantial difference in uh, Section 248 citing process for energy generation. So um, it's kind of a, a CYA factor that we're working on sticking into the uh, the town plan. Oh, and then we would also like you to know that we are planning on having some public comment opportunities for in the coming months uh, as the plan begins to come together. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, a person over there had a question. Please uh, identify yourself. Thanks. Here comes our runners. Thank you. I'm Patty Giovara. I'm a member of a new committee uh, that uh, formed in 2023 here in East Montpelier, and that's the Emergency Preparedness Committee. We're on page 57, and all of the members are listed. Um, it's called Emergency Planning, uh, but we changed the name to Preparedness, so that's the difference on page 57. Um, the goal of the committee is really to um, be ready um, to help ourselves and our neighbors uh, stay safe during extreme weather events. Uh, several of those uh, types have been mentioned here today um, during power outages, road closures, and other um, uh, things that, that happen. So um, one of the things is we don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, so we're being careful to make sure that we're learning about resources that currently exist. And we want to increase awareness um, for all of us in the town about what some of those resource, resources are. Uh, we're learning from and partnering with the Callis Emergency Management uh, team. Uh, there's actually a training coming up this Saturday if anybody's interested in shelters. Um, the Callis Emergency um, Management team is sponsoring a training. I can tell you more about that. Uh, we're working um, with the uh, select board and the emergency management coordinator and emergency management director on ways to improve communications during emergencies. Another piece that we're working on is a neighborhood groups model. I know that um, um, lots of us uh, help our neighbors out during times of emergency. Uh, what we want to do is bring a little bit more structure and, and help to neighborhood groups um, so that we can really be prepared, know what resources our closest neighbors have and what help they might need. So um, two things for today uh, that I specifically want to mention. Um, so several uh, community uh, committee members are here. They can raise their hands. The who's on the committee, and um, listed also on page 57. We have some handouts um, for you. So uh, there's giveaways that uh, are on the table um, from Vermont Emergency Management primarily. 
So, and also, so we welcome more people to get involved, whether you have ideas, whether you want to be part of the committee. And another piece of this is that we're also helping the select board um, to identify uh, candidates who might be interested in being emergency management director for the town. Seth fills that role now as the select board chair, but he is uh, open that if there's somebody um, who's interested in taking on more leadership roles around emergency management or emergency preparedness, please let us know. Thanks. Thanks, Patty. Thank you very much. Also note, <laughs> I should have noted that uh, when Mr. Miracle was speaking that the Energy Committee report is also in the next page before, on page 56. And any other, other business from the Assembly, Nona, Estrin, I see, and Zach, and Rachel, who was, told me she was standing in line. So, okay. Uh, Nona, do you have a few, a few minutes, a couple minutes on the topic? Hi. This year, we had an emergency that none of us anticipated, certainly I didn't, which was we didn't get our mail for long periods of time. And uh, this uh, came as a huge surprise and a shock. And there are many mem members of our community that depend on the mail for checks that they live on, et cetera, et cetera, medications that come. You know, it just was a huge uh, hitch. And uh, neighborhoods got together, our neighborhood got together and um, picked up mail for one another. But that's a piece of emergency preparedness that I never would have prepared for or expected. And I want to take this opportunity to thank our postmaster and his helpers. He was delivering mail after 9.30 at night uh, on... Uh, so... Thank him, thank them, thank them all, and keep planning. <laughs> Rachel, um, Edie e Miller uh, has her hand up. Rachel, do you have something you wanted to add? I do, but I can wait. Okay, so Edie Miller and then Rachel Wilson, please. I would like to make a plea for more involvement for town and school meetings and in one specific way. Uh, we, last night I attended the informational session for the school because I've been out of touch with them and I wanted to hear more about that. Unfortunately, it overlapped with the informational meeting, which I usually go to for the town. I would like to urge the town and the school to work together and not do that. That's happened the last two years. I think it's discouraging uh, involvement with both. And um, there's no need for it, I don't think. Um, I hope there's no need for it. But I, you know, I think those, I'm speaking to the choir here, all of us are here because we want to be here and we um, hold town meeting in, in esteem and regard. So let's do everything we can to keep it going. Good point, Edie. Uh, Rachel Grossman. I have two things, and I'm going to be brief because I understand lunch is getting cold and people are probably hungry. <laughs> um, but I have been um, noticing that I read an article that there are some towns that are hiring community nurses. And the community nurses do outreach and advocacy for people who need it in town who are falling through the cracks and provide services. And I also read that the state may be funding those positions sometime in the future. But I just think that um, I'd love the select board to look into that more and see about possibly having a community nurse or social worker or somebody in town who can reach out to vulnerable people who are not getting the services that they need, um, which often saves us money in the long run. So that was the first thing. And then the second thing is, this is Sue Racanelli's last year of providing us with a stellar lunch. <laughs> Sue took over the reins for me, I don't know how many years ago, and brought lunch to just another level. And this is her last year. And so th I wanted to thank her and also remind everybody in town that if no one steps up to do town meeting lunch next year, there won't be a potluck. 
So um, I, 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 that sounds very threatening, but um, <laughs> it, you know, Sue, Sue's done her time. So thank you, Sue. Thank you. Any other matters under other business um, from the assembly? Zach Sullivan. Just very quick update from the Planning Commission. We're starting the process of rewriting the town plan, which is due in 2026. Um, so it's a multi-year process. As part of that, we do have a survey available, trying to get opinion from people in the town that is available on the town table just outside the door, if anyone would like to take it. This is not your only opportunity. It will be on Front Porch Forum. It will be in other venues. We will, you know, we will get that survey out there, but we wanted to make it available to people at town meeting in case anyone wanted to take it here. Thanks, Zach. Ed, Z Ed Deegan, and then is there anyone else before we have a brief comment from the economic development? Ed. Uh, uh, so I've been involved in many hats over the years from the rec board up to the justice of the peace and everything else. I want to thank everybody that volunteers in this town um, and all of our employees, Rosie, uh, Michelle, Gina, doing a terrific job. We were very lucky with the transition that occurred uh, from Don and Bruce. We, we've come out the other end, they're in very good shape. And uh, the, certainly the select board, I think, uh, and I'm a fiscal conservative here, um, nobody does this for the money, okay? They're not doing it for the money, <laughs> okay? And I don't serve on committees for the money. There's no money in, in this for me, I, they, you know. Uh, but the select board stipend hasn't been moved in many, many years. And I gotta tell you, these guys are like, you know, my, it's come up a couple of times when there's a position and my wife's like, you're crazy, you're not gonna take that. There's so much work is involved. There's multiple meetings each month, they go for hours along, and then in between there's a numerous other things that they're just constantly dealing with stuff for this town. So A, I wanna thank you. And B, I want to put into, you know, maybe not a discussion, but just input that maybe we should be looking at increasing the stipend a little bit for these guys. They, they were like, a, forget minimum wage, they're like a dollar an hour based on, on the amount of work that uh, they do. And, and I don't know if everybody knows how much is involved and how much work these guys do for us. So thank you all. Thanks, Ed. Uh, anything else from the floor? Um, before, uh, oh, I have one quick announcement from Rosie. There's a rabies clinic at the East Montpelier Fire Department Saturday from 9 to 12, and dog lysing is also available. Um, is Abby Jen here? Um, come on up. Oh, get, grab a microphone, please. Thank you. Abby is uh, with the um, Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation. Wanted to say a few words before we break. She, she is not a resident of East Montpelier. So without objection, I would let her speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Abby Jenny. This is Nursi Sheehan. And we're here representing the Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation. Has anybody heard of us? All right. That's 50%. So this little talk is for the other 50% of you who haven't heard of us. Um, we're here to remind you that we offer a huge variety of free services for business owners or people who are curious about entrepreneurship. Um, it's totally free. Our website is www.centralvermont.org. It's really easy to remember. It's the org bit that will trip you up. Um, but feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we've done a lot of work with our all-volunteer board of directors. Um, we serve business owners and employers at every phase of business development and, um, and growth in 22 municipalities in central Vermont, including yourselves, all of Washington County, as well as Washington and Orange. Um, this summer, I started working there, so I'm a little new, but I worked in their small business flood recovery center in Montpelier where flood impacted businesses could come and get support, um, be it grant writing support, uh, necessary docu documentation support, like they didn't have their ducks in a row and it's hard to get funding when you don't. Um, we gave referrals to free legal support provided by the Vermont Law School. We met with landlords on behalf of businesses. We assisted with SBA loan applications in our office and in person at SBA sites. Uh, we reached out to the federal and Washington County legislative delegations and testified before the federal delegation and the Vermont State Economic Development and House of Commerce included 
uh, the federal delegation and staff in meetings. So we're kind of a link between y'all with your small businesses and big businesses and the legislators sometimes. Not lobbyists, but we do collect a lot of data from you folks and present it. Am I forgetting anything? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so thank you, because I know that you're looking for lunch. So uh, does anyone have any questions? Any questions for, um, uh, for Abby? Yeah, and if you just want more information, my email is abby, A-B-B-Y, at centralvermont.org, and you can reach out to me or give us a call. And this is Mercy. She's Mercy at centralvermont.org, if you like her better. So thank you very much for your continued level funding, helping us stay afloat. We really appreciate you. So uh, have a great day. A motion to adjourn would be in order. Uh, Mr. Morey, seconded by Becky Reed. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn, say aye. aye. All those opposed, say nay. The ayes have it. The meeting is adjourned.